OK, can everyone hear me at the back? Yeah, kind of. OK, good. So um, I suppose, first of all, I'd like to send a, a, a shout out to the internal auditors from the Ministry of Law, if you're still here. Uh, my wife works at the Ministry of Law, so uh, please be nice to her next time you're auditing her department. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, this topic, why didn't anyone call the whistleblowing hotline? Um, and uh, normally I'm asked to talk about how do we make a whistleblowing hotline effective. Um, but I guess I should not be surprised at a conference of internal auditors, people whose job it is to find breaches and failures, uh, that we have such a pessimistic question to kick off with. Why didn't it work? Um, so I'm going to go through uh, various of the reasons, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and uh, see whether we can pull it together and talk about what works as we do it. Uh, but uh, I've also embedded in the slides, or I've, I've provided in, uh, for the app, some questions. Uh, I'm going to poll you all at various stages. So I hope you'll help me out by answering the poll questions, because otherwise I shall mark it down as a serious non-compliance and take it from there. So uh, that would be absolutely fantastic if you could help out. All right. Um, so I'm just going to dive in and start um, addressing the issues. But I thought perhaps, first of all, what we should really talk about um, is why are they actually important in the first place? And I'm going to approach this question two ways. The first is I'm going to give you all of the sensible reasons. And the second is I'll give you uh, some experience of mine, which tells me why I still think that they're worth having uh, and why they're worth doing well. So sensible reasons first. Well, most obviously, uh, Whistleblowing hotlines are a good way of detecting fraud, bribery, corruption, so on and so forth in your organization. Uh, from the last KPMG Global Profile of a Fraudster survey, we found that 20% of frauds were detected uh, via whistleblowing hotlines, and 24 were detected by tip-offs through other informal channels. So it's pretty clear that tip-offs are an important part of the fraud detection toolkit. In fact, when it looks at when we looked at frauds committed by large groups of people conspiring together, what we found was that by far the most effective way of detecting them, uh, by a margin of about 56%, uh, were tip-offs, because they're so hard to detect, because the involvement of multiple parties makes it so easy to override controls. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners also runs a, an annual survey, um, uh, which it calls, um, I think it's the Report to the Nations, and in that, uh, they found that 39% of fraud cases were detected through, um, through tip-offs as well. So you can see there's a pretty consistent line there, even from other parties. And what they noted was that uh, for those organizations that had structured hotlines, 47% of frauds were detected using those hotlines on average, whereas for those that don't have them, only 28% detected fraud through tip-offs. So in other words, there's a significant difference in the ability to detect when you have one versus when you don't. They're also, uh, as you can see, uh, I've suggested cost effective because they use assets that you already have. Assets is a very inhuman way of referring to human beings. In other words, you have employees in your organization who day to day are sitting, doing the job. They understand it better than anyone else in the organization and they're the ones who are capable of identifying when something is not being done according to plan. They're the ones on the ground when something is done wrong. So they're cost effective because you're already paying for these little detectives in every room in every workplace. But perhaps most importantly, moving beyond the idea that employees are cost effective, is that we talk a lot about things like process uh, automation. Process automation is very, very good for detecting fraud. I highly recommend using data analytics to look at the data that you generate through process automation. But what I do find is that there's a lot of information in your organization that you will never see because it never ends up in an automated process generating data. For that, you need human beings with eyes and ears to do the job for you. And I think one of the last reasons why people most often look at using whistleblowing hotlines is because of the positive effect it has on the ethical environment. It stands for organizational transparency. It means that we are open to hearing what might be going wrong in our organization. And that itself is a very powerful message. So those are all of the rational reason, reasons why we, why we like whistleblowing hotlines. Um, the other reason is, just from experience, that I have been involved in many investigations in my nearly 11 years in Singapore, 
One of the first ones I did in Singapore was at a, as a sports club uh, in town. And the financial controller was uh, stealing money from the games room. And she was putting, uh, taking it out in cash, putting some into the bank, keeping some to herself. And when it was finally detected, to cut a very long story short, we did an investigation and we concluded that at the outset it was obvious that she couldn't have done it without anyone else noticing because the cash from the gaming room was withdrawn by her staff and was paid into the bank by her staff. So they should have noticed the difference. So we assuming that there was a conspiracy imaged, which is to say created a forensic copy of all of the computers in the accounts department, and we started looking through their correspondence to see what we could see. And what we saw was a correspondence like this. One member of staff sitting at their desk, I'll act it out for you so you can live the experience a little bit more, would type, oh no, she's stolen another $7,000. And the other member of staff would sit there and type back using Yahoo Messenger, so you can tell this is a while ago, oh no, I pray to God she stops doing this soon. And these members of staff were not involved in the fraud in the sense that they were deliberately facilitating it, but their boss was doing something and they did not have or did not feel they had the opportunity to say anything about it. Completely wrongly, they could have mentioned it and something would have been done. But the fact is that they had people there who knew and had direct evidence of the frauds. The bookkeepers were writing pencil annotations into the books to record the amounts that were missing so that they could balance them, but were not taking that opportunity. So that's one reason, a real reason, why we can see the whistleblowing hotlines are actually quite important. All right, so why no calls? The question we, we started with. Well, KPMG um, provides whistleblowing hotline services to quite a wide range of clients, and those range from the public sector to the private, from listed companies to small private companies, uh, from Singapore-based companies to multinational companies. And we have quite a bit of experience in seeing hotlines that work and hotlines that don't. So one example of one that doesn't, uh, we provide hotline services to a Japanese multinational. And they have about 150,000 people in Asia Pacific, and that's the line that we manage for them. In the three years we provided that service to them, we've had a grand total of no complaints whatsoever on the hotline, which is a completely incomprehensible number. But what it tells me, and I think what's important to remember is, when we're looking at hotlines or we're looking at most controls, culture is actually the most important factor. It's the deciding factor. The culture in this organization, no matter, no matter how much an external provider pushes and tries, is the culture in the organization, and they do not have a complaints culture. And when I go through and I talk about why things aren't working, I'll say, OK, we should, be doing, uh, we should be doing step A or step B. But if you don't have those in place and you struggle to put them in place, it's more an indicator that there is a cultural problem than it is an indicator that it's a control problem. I personally think all of these will come back ultimately to do you have the culture uh, to run such a whistleblowing hotline effectively. So let's look on the bright side to start with, shall we? Uh, let's say you have a perfectly decent whistleblowing hotline, but maybe it was detected another way. So as you can see, uh, I've already mentioned the 24 and 20% that are detected by tip-offs. 22% is management review. So it's good to know that management is actually doing something valuable in the company, not just creating paperwork. One of the things that I always like to pull out, because I personally don't work in internal audit, and many of my colleagues do, is the next two statistics. 14% um, of frauds were discovered by accident. Um, but 14% were also discovered by internal audit. Um, so without wanting to depress you guys, you've got roughly the same rate as by accident at the moment. <laughs> it could be worse, though. Uh, you could be external audit, which only detects 6% of, uh, of frauds. However, the fact is that external audit and internal audit are ex post facto reviews. It's happening after the event. So that probably doesn't help a great deal. One of the things that's very interesting is forensic data analytics only accounts for 3% of fraud detection. And that, to me, indicates that it is woefully underused. People are really not using it effectively. Because if it's only 3% of detection, either you're not running it or you're running some pretty awful forensic data analytics. So maybe the reason no one's called the hotline is they don't need to. You detected it by accident. Perhaps a suspicious superior noticed it. That's the last of the good attractive options that I can offer. 
So I'm going to ask you a question now, um, and you'll probably notice as we go through these questions, they're a little bit, they're a little bit orientated towards you, um, giving me an idea of why maybe nobody's calling this line. So the first question is this. I specifically recall my organization's reporting channel and how to use it being actively highlighted to me in the last 12 months. You have two possible answers. Answer one is yes. Answer two is, yeah, I don't really remember it. Or maybe it was a bit longer ago, I'm not really sure. So I'm going to ask you to vote on that particular poll now. And this is your opportunity to pretend that you're still working while playing with your phone while I speak. So you might want to take it straight away. Okay, I'll give you, ooh, I don't know, some seconds. Can we stick the polling up so I can see whether anyone is voting at all? Or not, we're keeping it a mystery. Okay, I tell you what, I can ask you, since this is a binary question, to raise your hands instead. How about that? Raise your hands if someone has highlighted your hotline to you any time in the last 12 months. Okay, I can see that's a half hand. Okay, I'm going to take that as being the gospel truth, that literally only one person in this room half remembers having been told about their whistleblowing hotline. Okay, there we go. See, a lot more enthusiastic. 60-40. 60, 60, so in other, in other words, in the last year, only six out of 10 of you have had a whistleblowing hotline highlighted to you, which probably, I think, if we can go back to the slides, rather raises uh, the next point that I was going to make, which is um, perhaps people are not actually using the whistleblowing hotline because maybe 40% of them have no idea that there's a whistleblowing hotline. Perhaps 40% of them were told about it once, but are so overworked that it's been forced out of their minds and that they no longer remember that they can use it. So if we can go back to the slides. Hopefully, <laughs> sometime soon. Otherwise, I'll have to make up this entire talk based on this single answer. Trust me, you will get bored after the next 12 minutes of me extemporizing on the topic of yes or no. Actually, we, um, only last week we had our forensic conference here, and we were showing off uh, various slides that we'd carefully developed for an extra widescreen, and then we realized that the projector that we had only did regular widescreen, not extra widescreen. As a result, it had uh, an awful lot of difficulties with our presenters standing right in the middle of things that were not properly displaying at any point. Anyway, okay, I tell you what, while they sort the slides out, I'll take you through what I was going to say for the slides. Essentially, um, there are a number of difficulties. How do we actually alert people? Do they not know about it because you only tell them annually, or maybe you don't even tell them annually at all? Do they not know about it because even though you tell them annually, you tell them in an email, which we all know pretty much any official email that, that lands in our inbox, we simply delete. Do they not know about it because you've put it on the intranet, but you've never actually alerted anyone to its existence at all? Do we have things like posters up where people will see it while they're waiting for the lavatory or the lifts? At least they might get actually uh, attracted to it. Do we run meetings or trainings where we mention it and actively promote it? Because if we don't, people probably aren't aware it's existing. We should also be looking at whether we're taking the opportunity to promote it whenever possible. So some organizations in the US, for example, print their whistleblowing hotline on the bottom of their invoices and purchase orders so that even their suppliers and vendors know that it's there. Then there's the question of to whom are we actually promoting it? Maybe we're not telling the people who need to know. So yes, everyone in the office receives the email, but let's say you work for N Parks. You're mostly out protecting our arboreal heritage from attack by weevils and, and evil developers with chainsaws. You're probably not spending a lot of time reading your email at your desk. What about your support staff, the security guards? Do we even employ the security guards at our office? Most of us don't, they're normally outsourced. And that means that another organization is receiving important information about fraud, and we're not getting it. Are we looking at our cleaners who are there after hours and might notice whether somebody's behaving suspiciously after hours? Again, we're, we're probably not. And how do we actually promote it? Putting up a poster with a big telephone is one thing, but actually making it memorable by using things like a specific issue. If you look at... Uh, 
You know, there's a period two years ago when, for a change, the Straits Times was actually a really interesting read because there were lots of prosecutions going on for corruption, you might recall. There was the horrible law professor, there was the guy from SCDF, all of these things were happening. Exciting news, right? For a change, you opened the Straits Times and there was real dirt in there. You didn't have to go to the new paper to get it. And those are good opportunities, while people are thinking about these issues, to promote these lines. So every time something goes wrong in KPMG, our managing partner sends around an email saying, look at the disaster in South Africa. This is why we have the following things in place. Those are interesting opportunities to promote it. But he doesn't do it in a long, boring email. He just makes it very short, two or three sentences, so people actually read it. In other words, we need to grab attention, not be super dull, which I suspect is probably what I'm risking doing by banging on about this topic right now. So that's one issue. OK, the next set of questions. How do you actually arrange your organization's reporting channel? Is it externally managed? Again, these are all in your, in your apps. Is it internal, i.e. goes to internal audit or compliance or a similar department? And I should say, I know I'm at an internal audit um, conference, and therefore you all think of yourselves as being independent of management. But the bad news is that outside external and internal audit, almost nobody thinks of internal audit as being anything other than part of the management of the company. So when your employees are reporting to internal audit, they think of you as being internal, even though you are uh, nominally independent. Is it internal to the board or the audit committee? Is it internal to HR or another functional department? Or do you not really have one, and if someone has a problem, they immediately ring CPIB and, and dob whoever it is in for a copy session uh, with the boys from CPIB? OK, so I think I've talked enough. Can we see what the results are? Hmm. OK, so externally managed is, is 12%. Internal to internal audit or compliance is, is the, the bare majority, 38%. Internal to the board or audit committee is 21%. And I'm going to tell you why I think that's a bad idea in a minute. And internal to HR or another department is 27%, which I'm also going to tell you why I think is a bad idea in a minute. The Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau is probably not your go-to option for whistleblowing, I would say. Because if someone's just stolen a couple of pencils out of the stationery cabinet, you're probably wasting their time. But there we go. Can we go back to the slides? OK, so what are the difficulties? You've got, a vari you've got various options. Um, yes, you can send it to a trained third party. And as you can imagine, we're a trained third party. So accordingly, uh, conflict of interest disclosure that's my favorite option. Um, but also, uh, there are internal management and senior management. But each of those options has different trust implications. If you're asking somebody to ring the head of your audit committee or somebody on your board, and that person is a janitor in the building, how comfortable do you think they feel ringing someone at the top of the mountain when they're at the bottom of the mountain? Not at all comfortable. It is generally not effective at getting lower level employees to report. If you're asking them to report to internal audit or compliance, I would say there is a somewhat higher chance that that department is trusted than other internal operational departments such as HR. Our experience is that people don't seem to trust HR. I don't know why that is, but they just don't seem to. So HR department lines do not do very well. Internal audit gets more calls than HR. But also, we have to look at what mechanisms we allow. So we typically use a web portal. And web portals are great. It allows us to structure incoming information. Um, but again, if you think that the T auntie in your building is a regular user of websites like that, you're probably kidding yourself. You need to make it open to that person to actually connect through a more appropriate mechanism. So we typically say as many options as possible are best. It can be email, it should be phone, whether that's 24 hour or office hour. Um, but it's often worth bearing in mind that people don't really like to make whistleblowing phone calls from their desk. So outside office hours is usually pretty good. We even say fax and post should be allowed. Why is that? Because sometimes people want to send you documents. And there are a few things that are better in an investigation than someone giving you evidence rather than just giving you their story. So we always say you should leave it open in as many ways as possible. So are people comfortable using it? Are they able to use it? Those are the two big questions. OK, the next question. And this is a bit of a biggie. The question is, I am 100% certain that if I report something using my organizational uh, reporting channel, my identity will not be disclosed if I so request. 
If you request anonymity, are you 100% certain that you will remain anonymous? Two options, yes, of course I will. Option two, yeah, well, I don't know. Okay, vote, and then we'll, uh, let's take a look at the, at the results as they come in. Yeah. <laughs> I am not at all surprised. Um, let's, let's, go back to the, uh, let's go back to the slides. But the fact that six in 10 of you are not confident that you will remain anonymous if you ask to be anonymous tells you a lot about what you might believe about the culture of the organization you're working in. Bear in mind your internal audit as well. So I'd hope you guys had the most faith of anybody given, the, given what you see. But the fact is that, again, do you think that if you are six out of 10 of you are not confident that a janitor is going to be confident? He's not. So why do we talk about the importance uh, of possible anonymity? Anonymity is uh, one of those areas where we often get a lot of pushback. Uh, and organizations will say to us, we don't really want to get anonymous reports. We think that people should be made to give their name when they report. And we typically we push back. We don't believe it's best practice. And there are two very obvious logical reasons why it's not best practice. The first is, if let's say you receive an email at your whistleblowing hotline, which is a video of your permanent secretary taking bribes to benefit a commercial organization, but it's sent to you anonymously, are you just going to delete that video and never look at it? Obviously not, right? It would be negligent to ignore it. In fact, given the criminal procedure code, it might well be criminal for you to ignore it if you see it. So in other words, you are not going to ignore a high quality anonymous tip. So there is no point in trying to reject anonymous tips. The second reason why it's important is this. You cannot stop people sending you anonymous tips. In about five seconds, any of us can create an effectively anonymous email address from a webmail provider. You can say, I don't accept them, but they will come through anyway. Does your organization have a telephone number? Then people can ring it anonymously. So you are going to receive anonymous tips whether you like it or not. In other words, the we do not accept anonymous tips approach is flawed both in the sense that you will still get them and flawed in the sense that you will still have to do something about them. What we do say is you should encourage people to leave their contact details if at all possible because it makes following up on the investigation a hundred times easier if you can speak to the whistleblower and clarify things as you go along. But anonymity remains important. And why? Well, um, people are mostly concerned about protection from reprisals. There is uh, a perception of protection that they are confident that their organization will protect them, which is very hard to create. It's very hard to create because you can only prove it through practice. And otherwise, people have to make a cultural assessment of the organization that this is an organization or this is a line that I trust. And that's one of the reasons why we tend to push external whistleblowing hotlines, aside from the fact, obviously, that it's a revenue generator for us, is that when you ring KPMG, for example, I am definitely not going to rat you out for a single whistleblowing hotline client because I could destroy my company in doing so, and it's just not worth it. Internally, you have to work very hard to make sure people are confident that you will actually protect their identities if they request it. The other thing is that whistleblowing is essentially a, a system whereby you complain about people at an equal level of you than you in the hierarchy or higher up in the organization. If you're complaining about your direct subordinate doing something, that's not whistleblowing, that's just management. So most of the time, people are actually complaining about their bosses in some way, which means that they feel more vulnerable than usual because they're complaining about somebody who has some hold over them or some ability to manage how well they do in the organization. So it creates a great deal of concern. And the way that companies need to deal with it is by careful messaging. So for example, we need to be clear that all complaints that are made honestly are protected, which is to say that I might make a complaint or I might make a report, and ultimately it turns out to be nothing. But you still want to have the opportunity to receive that, and you will have to be very clear that if anyone makes a report, which they do in good faith, they're protected from reprisals. Just because something isn't found at the end of the day doesn't mean they did it for a bad reason. And in fact, you want people to report things that seem suspicious or odd, even where they can't 100% prove it. 
Likewise, you need to be very careful on the messaging about unproven complaints. Because if there's this hint that if it's not found, we are going to whack you so hard, then people are not going to take the risk to report. They'd rather take the risk that they're found not to have done anything about the fraud. And then lastly, there's how do we message about what we call vexatious complaints, where people ring to complain about the biscuits in the pantry, or they ring to complain that, uh, once again, the chairman has bought a new BMW, um, and that, uh, meanwhile, they're driving a Toyota Corolla and life seems very unfair. Those are the sorts of complaints which are vexatious, but what we should be doing is we should be expressing clearly that we welcome all complaints, but that they should be about the areas that we then typically list below that they should be issues which uh, indicate misconduct, not issues which are perhaps complaints about the quality of the biscuits in the cafeteria. But even if you get complaints which are not high quality, you should deal with them, log them, and, and move on. So consequence worry is probably the main reason that people do not actually call whistleblowing hotlines. Are people right to be concerned? Well, I would say that people are generally correct to be concerned about the consequences, because I can tell you that, by and large, being a whistleblower does not pay. And when I say that, I mean that typically whistleblowers end up less well off than they used to be. How many of you can put your hand on your heart and say that if somebody is a whistleblower from another organization, that when you see their name and you remember that they're famous because they blew the whistle on that organization, how many of you can put your hand on your heart and say, I wouldn't think even twice about whether that was a factor in hiring them, and how many of you would think, uh, possibly, possibly a troublemaker, I'm not really sure. So it doesn't help them. And when we look at various surveys, for example, in the, in the Germany, France, Hong Kong, the US, oops, and the UK, we can see that business managers said that in their view, 18% of, 18 of business managers said that complainants would be treated less favorably in their organization as a result of complaining. 11% of them expected senior management to look for ways to terminate complainants. And of complainants, 55% um, expressed concern about the harm to their reputational career, which would prevent them from raising concerns. And another 55% said that they might be prevented from raising concerns because they are worried they might not remain anonymous. In other words, pretty clearly, People in organizations are saying that a lack of anonymity and protection from reprisals is a big concern when it comes to reporting. Now, the ACFE, uh, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, did a study in uh, Texas in 2010, and these are of cases where complainants filed suits against their employers. So it's worth bearing in mind that this is a slightly self-selected sample. These are people who are actually suing their employers. 74% of people who had made complaints uh, and sued their employers were terminated. 6% were suspended. 5% were transferred against their will. 15% got poor evaluations, were alleging they'd been demoted or harassed. Now, let's take the number at the bottom. 22% of them won their lawsuits. So let's be generous and say only one in five of these people was a legitimate complainant, which is, a, is pretty unlikely, let's be honest. One in five won their lawsuits. So we don't know what the real proportion is, but it's a minimum of one in five. If that's the case, there's at least a one in five chance that you're going to end up in pretty bad shape if you're a whistleblower. And it's interesting that of those who actually won their lawsuits, only 2% were reinstated and 8% actually won damages at the end of the day. So yes, I think people probably are right to be worried about the consequences. That's one of the reasons, probably, why they're not calling the whistleblowing hotline. And when we look, about, we look at complaints about retaliation, we can see that retaliation for reporting discrimination is actually the top complaint to the United States Equal Opportunity Commission. 45% approximately of reports mention, uh, mention uh, retaliation for making reports. And the number of reports of complainant retaliation to the US Occupational Safety and Health Administration has increased every single year since 2009. So it's a fairly ugly place to be a whistleblower. All right. <laughs> so that's very cheery, isn't it? Um, Another question. For you, again, this one is uh, in your experience in your organization. Where your organization has taken disciplinary action for misconduct, has it been communicated to the organization? Can you recall an incident where there's been a misconduct uh, found and it's been reported internally in the organization? So your options are yes, no, I'm not aware of any communication, 
or no, because we have never, ever had any issues of misconduct in my organization because we are literally that good. Those are your three options. So can we see the poll? Yeah. Okay, well, congratulations to the 3% um, who've never done anything wrong. Okay, uh, if, we go back to the, uh, if we go back to the slides. So, again, 6 in 10 people have heard no communication on uh, successful investigation and action on misconduct. And why is that important? Well, because people need to believe that calling the whistleblowing hotline will actually work. Maybe people don't believe it works. Because if they don't actually see a response or something coming out of misconduct, they don't necessarily have the confidence that your organization takes misconduct seriously enough for them to put themselves out there and risk retaliation in order to report it. So for them to believe it's going to work, what do they want to see? They want to see that there is a clear process to, ident to address things like conflicts of interest. They want to know that when they report through the whistleblowing hotline, you will be making sure it goes to the right person. They want to see a clear escalation process, that it shouldn't get trapped at some low level and shuffled into the undergrowth by, uh, by a junior manager. They need to know that it will go up to the appropriate level and be dealt with there. They're going to want to know is that actually a means by which we respond? Do we have a response protocol that they can actually see somewhere in your whistleblowing policy and understand? Does it have timelines in it? Is there a, histor a history of effective investigation and resolution that's then communicated out? Next, when people actually complain to your whistleblowing hotline, do they get a clear acknowledgement of their complaint? Do they get given a unique reference number if they're anonymous? Are they given, to the extent at least that's appropriate, updates such as, thank you for your complaint, we're looking into it, we anticipate completing our investigations within X period of time? Or when they complain, do they complain into a black hole and then sit there and wait and listen for something to come back and it never does? And then lastly, are we actually using it to learn? Are we saying, OK, we had this complaint, we're very happy that this complaint came in because it highlighted this problem we have. We've now fixed this problem as a result of the complaint, and we would like to commend you all to use our whistleblowing hotline because this enables our organization to be better, which does two things at once. It tells people we have a whistleblowing hotline and we want you to use it, and it also tells them that it's effective. So that's another element. If we're not communicating our response, why do people think you care? OK, the next question. <clears throat> Management shows a commitment not just to having a reporting channel, but also to communicating it in a way that genuinely encourages its use. Now, I ask this question because we do a lot of anti-bribery and corruption work at KPMG. So we help companies with bribery and corruption related issues. And one of the key things in bribery and corruption related um, risk management is we talk about the tone at the top. Now, the tone at the top is often uh, thought of as being literally what it sounds like, i.e. a noise. So many companies feel that they've addressed the tone at the top by wheeling the CEO on for five minutes at the beginning of the annual conference. He tells everybody to be good and not to bribe anybody. They wheel him back off again, and that's the last you hear of it for the whole year. But effective management uh, communication is repeated emphasis as well as demonstration of their belief in it. So I guess the questions are angled towards that. So the first option is yes. Senior management speaks positively about the need to use the line and the weight they attach to taking reports seriously. Next option, well, yes, they've mentioned it, but maybe the messaging could be a little bit better, i.e., there's a whistleblowing hotline, eh? I want you all to use it, eh? Okay, everyone? Okay, done? Okay, eh? Okay, fine. That's it. Or last option, not really. Maybe they were like, uh, by the way, everybody, we've uh, recruited KPMG to operate a hotline it's over there. That's it. And then you never hear anything about it ever again. So can we see the answers to the polls? Hmm. Okay, so it's a bit of a split. Um, so if we go back to the slides, I think the thing is most often um, also that the messaging is not very good. We sometimes are not very good in terms of relaying a message because we look at things from our own perspective as senior management. So for example, um, when we talk about how management talks about whistleblowing, we hear uh, certain things that come out to us every time we visit um, particular clients. One of the most common and, to me, most annoying statements I ever hear is, look, if complainants had confidence in their complaint, why do they need to be anonymous? 
Now, to me, I'm sure some of you have thought this at some point, but the problem is that the objections to it are very obvious. The first obvious objection is anonymity is going to happen anyway. We covered that several slides back. The second one is that it's not a lack of confidence in their complaint that stops people from complaining to your whistleblowing hotline. It's a lack of confidence in your organizational culture that they will not be retaliated against or it will not work against them in some way in the future. So in other words, there's a category error. Yes, they are not confident. No, they're not, not confident in their complaint. They are not confident in the organization. And if this is what management says, I would respectfully submit that they are right not to be confident in the organization. Because if you're at the very top of your organization and you make a statement like that, you've clearly not thought through carefully enough what anonymity actually means in these circumstances. So there's a couple of other things we hear. If when you're having a meeting with the client and you're discussing whistleblowing and some of the reports that come in, and people keep on referring to whistleblowers as being troublemakers or disgruntled, now that won't appear in official communication for an organization, but it tells you a whole world about the informal culture. If people are referring to whistleblowers as troublemakers, it means that probably that culture, the informal culture, permeates all the way down, and everyone in the organization knows that's how they're viewed, no matter what the official communications are. And I would argue that it is worse to state in official communications we, we welcome whistleblowers, but unofficially to consider them all to be just troublemakers, because it compounds the error of not getting in whistleblowers when they have something to report with hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is what's going to make people not trust your organization with their well-being when they want to make a report. And then the last is, can we punish them if we don't uphold the complaint? Which displays an incredibly binary attitude to the nature of proof. Some things we can prove, some things we can't prove. Now, the whole range of things we can't prove may be reasonable to complain about. The biscuits may well be terrible in the pantry, but we can't objectively, objectively prove that biscuits are terrible, therefore we're going to discipline the person who complains. We have to accept that people will make bona fide complaints, and a binary attitude to it, I think, tends also to seep down through the organization. Another element is that not everybody is culturally uh, particularly given to whistleblowing. So the company that I mentioned earlier uh, is Japanese, and uh, they have a relatively hierarchical uh, and respectful of seniority approach culturally within the organization. So we keep on saying to them, why don't we come around and give you free training so that your staff know how the whistleblowing hotline works? And they keep on saying, mm, thank you, we'll think about it, and then they never arrange it. Um, so they're clearly not interested, but it's not just uh, nationalities and cultures that is important. It's not groups like, okay, he's an un so he complains all the time. He, she's Chinese, therefore she only complains when you're not looking. This guy Malay, he's very laid back, he's not going to complain because he's happy. The, the, it's not helpful to have stereotypes of cultures when you're looking at why do people complain. And the reason it's not helpful to just say, okay, well, you know, a Japanese company is actually because within that company, different groups in that company have different attitudes so you'll look at people in financial reporting, they have a different attitude to whistleblowing to people who are in sales. And it's not a racial culture thing necessarily, it's a group uh, culture thing. So in other words, you actually need to think beyond going, okay, well, Japanese people don't complain very much, because it's not true. It's more of a department thing. The other thing is that, okay, sometimes you're going to need to be able to communicate to people who, for whom, in, particularly in Singapore, English might not be their first language. If you have a good whistleblowing policy, it will have quite a bit of detail in it. It will be clear, but it's going to use some quite cheap language. At the end of the day, your tea auntie, your security guard uncle, these guys may not have a really good working grasp of English. They will need to have it communicated to them in straightforward terms that they understand. And this happens to a lot of our clients the more you move outside Singapore. If you're doing a whistleblowing line for a company that has this service in Indonesia, you cannot expect somebody in Balikpapan to sit down and read a five-page whistleblowing policy in English. It's just not going to work. They're not going to do it. So you need to make sure it's in uh, some format or some language that they're going to be able to understand easily. And without that, you're not going to get people calling. And then lastly, using channels that that group is comfortable using. 
So as I said earlier, you may find that uh, some people like to use web portals. I'm a big fan of web portals. I like them. But then a lot of people don't. They want to report in some other way. Maybe what we need is like a WhatsApp group for it. Um, or, for example, you might have a mechanism that maybe people like to use Facebook. And you're all in the public sector, right? So you all have Facebook for government, or whatever it's called, which you presumably now can't access because of uh, IT uh, internet separation. Um, and so if you have a whistleblowing hotline that uses you know, Facebook for government, great. But people are going to struggle to use it because they can't use it from their desktop machines. They're going to have to use an internet-enabled machine to get onto it in order to make a complaint. So it needs to be something which is easy and appropriate for people to use. So I think one of the issues uh, as I talk through is not so much just that when I reach, is it a culture problem here, that uh, there is an internal culture problem and these are the only issues. I think if we look back at each of the things I've talked through, the anonymity, the, the willingness to make it easy for people to use, um, to look at whether or not people uh, are presented with a serious and well thought out approach to investigating complaints that come up and treating people who make complaints as adult partners in the conversation where you're trying to detect fraud, you can tell a lot about the organization's culture and how it actually approaches whistleblowing, which is why culture is actually the thing that underlies it all. Okay, so I'm gonna spend uh, the last 10 minutes talking about the kind of the key features of an effective whistleblowing channel, and then I'm going to kick it over to questions for you guys. And I'm, I'm not sure whether you have any questions or not, uh, because I think you can submit them using the app, and therefore when we reach the end, I'll discover whether you are all actually sleeping after lunch, or whether you've been listening intently to everything I've said, um, or maybe I've just answered all your questions already, I don't know. Um, but there are particular features of whistleblowing channels that are important when they're going to be effective. They need to be something which inspires confidence. And one of the purposes of internal audit is to inspire confidence in the internal environment of an organization. Your job is probably to make sure, say, your audit committee is confident in, ter in terms of the internal organization. But if, for example, you are the whistleblowing hotline for your organization, the independence of internal audit is one of the most important elements in reassuring people that this is a line that they can trust. It's a line that's not going to allow their details to slip out. It's not going to be something whereby when you pick up the phone and you recognize the voice, because maybe uh, your ministry has th 300 people in it and you already know everybody, that you're going to say to the, your next door neighbor, actually, I think this is Owen complaining about the biscuits again. We should just fire this guy. In other words, they need to have confidence that the line is properly independent from line management, because that's where it's going to cause problems. And that doesn't just mean independent from line management in the sense of not discussing it with line management, but it means separate security arrangements for things like uh, people's uh, names, the reporting, the data that's gathered in investigations. They therefore also need to be confident that they are anonymous, because as we've seen from the statistics and the surveys earlier, uh, and honestly from my personal experience, it is a tough life as a whistleblower. Generally speaking, it is not going to get you promoted being a whistleblower. Therefore, if you want these people to help you out, you are going to have to help them out. Because what you're effectively inviting people to do is something which, at best, has a one in five chance of harming their career, and probably, in truth, has a much higher chance of harming their career. So they need to be confident that if they are scared of reprisals, that you will protect their identity. The next is that your organizational messaging needs to be very clear that people who make a bona fide report, and not all reports are complaints, some of them may be something along the lines of, this person is always working late on a, on a Saturday, I'm not sure why they're working late on a Saturday, but they work in financial reporting, I'm, I'm a bit concerned. That's not really a complaint, that's information. And if it's a bona fide report, and you look into it, and it turns out that person is working late on a Saturday because your ministry has like incredibly long working hours and no additional headcount is available, but they're such a committed public servant that they are going to work through until the job is done anyway, then that's great. You've got useful information. You've checked it out. Nobody's doing anything wrong. Everybody should be happy. But by communicating that you welcome all bona fide complaints, and you will be very careful about how you consider complaints which are not found, you will actually build employee confidence. Then we've got employee awareness. 
as I mentioned earlier, one of the major issues that we typically see in organizations we talk to is that nobody tells people about the hotline. And you'll notice that, what was it, six out of 10 of you, I can't remember which proportion, it was reasonably high. Really, no one had mentioned the hotline to them for some time, assuming that you have one. Unless you keep this sort of thing front and center in people's minds, we are all busy. We've all got 100 things to do most days, and people will let it drop out of their mind. But it's not just that you publicize it internally so that people know it exists. It's that they must be able to understand it. Why must they be able to understand it? Because if they understand it, they will be able actually to assess whether or not they are comfortable using it. One of the major problems with most reporting is that if you whistleblow on your company and you then wait two months for something to happen, for those two months, putting yourself in the shoes of the whistleblower, you have no idea what is happening in the organization. You have no idea what process has been going through. You have no idea who's been told about it. If you have clear reporting channels that are set out and are explained properly in your whistleblowing policy, they have some confidence of the process that's going to be followed. And then last of all is the, the organizational response itself. Have you trained your employees who take uh, the whistleblowing complaints? If they're internal audit, yeah, we're, we're accountants, right? We're used to taking down facts and trying to build up whatever information it is we need to understand the situation. But accountants are not, generally speaking, actually trained to take complaints about fraud, bribery, and corruption. So in other words, are we training people on how to ask the right questions? Have we given them training on asking the who, why, where, what, how, and when questions that enable them to elicit valuable information? Do we have a pre-planned protocol? In other words, when someone rings the whistleblowing hotline, do you pick it up and then go, uh, hello, who's this? And it doesn't inspire confidence. Do you crack open the plan and you start working your way through it? Because if you do, then that makes it much, much more likely that the response to the whistleblower is going to be effective. It makes it much more likely that that individual whistleblower has much more confidence. And it also means that once you've finished with that whistleblower, the next whistleblower will have much more confidence once they've seen you say internally, look, we had a report on our channel, we looked into it, we took X many weeks, we came up with an investigation report, it's been reviewed by the appropriate parties, we've taken the following remedial action, and everything has worked out as it should have worked out. And it takes a degree of strength in an organization to say, we will air our dirty laundry in order to prove that we are good at doing laundry when our laundry is dirty but it is a very important element of an organization's response. And then last of all, um, we talk a lot about whistleblowing hotlines, but actually whistleblowing hotlines on their own are not a quick fix. They're just one measure out of hundreds of measures organizations need to take to manage risks of things like fraud, bribery, and corruption. You can't just stick a whistleblowing hotline onto an organization and expect its culture to transform overnight. The important elements that build up to that, that fraud risk management framework, and I understand that you, you had a presentation about fraud risk management, I think it was yesterday, is that this is one important detection measure. It makes it easier for you to detect because you're likely to be receiving something between 20 and 40% of your complaints via tip-offs, and if you've structured it properly, you will receive them in a structured way. But uh, at the same time, people are not going to use it if they don't believe the organization is serious about fraud, if you haven't trained them on what counts as misconduct, if you haven't taken them through their code of conduct on an annual basis, you've got them to sign up that they are going to obey the code of conduct and that they are aware that there's a whistleblowing channel that they are obliged to call if they're aware of if any issues. Um, but also, when you, look at the, um, when you look at the framework that you've got in place, how do you actually make use of the inputs and outputs of your whistleblowing system? Are you getting value of, out of it? Instead of just using it as a single source of information, are you using it to drive the perception that you have a transparent organization? And are you using the results of it to drive and train your staff to be aware that fraud is a risk that is around them the whole time? They need to keep their eyes out. And when they see something, they need to report it and do something about it. So I think those cover most of the key features that I think you need to see in an effective reporting channel. If you don't have those, then the answer to the question, why did nobody call the whistleblowing hotline, should be fairly apparent. And that's because these things are not in place. 
But a final reason, I think, why uh, whistleblowing hotlines are so important to organizations which are particularly under public scrutiny, by which I mean any organization that almost anyone in this room is a, a member of, is this. When you look at the KPMG Global Profile of a Fraudster survey, we say about 20% of reports were through the formal hotline, 24% are through informal channels. Through the formal hotline, you have the opportunity to form and manage the way complaints come in, the way they're dealt with, to manage the appropriate stakeholders, to be ahead of the complaint, to ensure that you're communicating appropriately with all the stakeholders, and that you are in control of the situation. Informal met methods of making complaints include things like stomp, which we last, is the last thing we ever want to see ourselves in, right? I don't know if you've been watching about this unfortunate BMW driver who uh, apparently only wanted to pay 10 bucks at Caltex. And did we see that? So looking at that recently, um, you know, th those are one of the examples where we often see corporates getting picked up and Caltex is now running around responding to this issue um, in a way that they wouldn't have had to do if all of this had happened internally. So bearing in mind that external whistleblowing hotlines um, or informal external lines like that, i.e. Stomp and the front page of the Straits Times and the new paper and, and the Dow Bao or whatever, whatever newspaper you read, are terrible, terrible ways to find out about issues in your organization. And they're terrible ways to find out about it because you're on the back foot immediately. Everyone in your organization will be stressed because somebody in CPIB is already ringing to find out what's going on. There are questions being asked in Parliament about how come N Parks has lost 50 trees somewhere. And it doesn't enable you to manage in a calm, considered way. So my last word on the topic is, OK, forgetting about why it looks good for your organization, forgetting about why it uses the resources you've got in the organization, as a department that has to manage issues relating to fraud and misconduct, this is something which allows you to get ahead of the game and manage how the game plays out. If you don't do that, you're going to be sitting watching it unfold in front of you on Channel News Asia over your cornflakes in the morning, which is the least pleasant way to deal with any fraud or misconduct incident. Not least because your permanent secretary will be tearing his or her hair out and demanding answers faster than you can provide them. So that's probably the most important reason at some level for why organizations like to have that available. All right, I said I'd leave six or seven minutes at the end for questions, if indeed there are any questions. So this is the moment where we find out whether there are any questions. There have been people paying attention, Owen. Uh, we, uh, may we take an opportunity to invite you to share your opinions on some of the points that came into the app. Mm. Now the first being, what is a typical profile of a fraudster? in your opinion. Okay, uh, the typical profile of a fraudster, let me stand center stage because uh, the typical profile of a fraudster is usually somewhere between late 30s and early 40s, uh, is male, um, is in a position of reasonable seniority in their organization. Um, they, uh, yes, they uh, tend to have a style which is either on the one hand autocratic, i.e. they do not tolerate a great deal of intrusion within their personal reasoning and business processes, or uh, they're somebody who is externally um, quite, has quite an outgoing personality, uh, and generally speaking is, is a bit larger than life. So those are the two different angles of the, of the typical fraudster. But essentially, if you want to know what a typical fraudster looks like, it's, it's us two. Yeah. It is. Uh, our next uh, point we'd like to share your opinion on, how does outsourcing the whistleblower function work? Uh, are the trusted third party obligated to investigate every single complaint, many of which majority might just uh, be around or amount to nothing at all and will not be very costly? Would that be very costly? Okay, so um, it, it's not very costly. Um, and the reason it's not very costly is because the external party doesn't investigate everything. Um, what happens is, uh, let me take you through the, the process at KPMG, but I'm, I'm sure a similar process will apply at all of our, our competitors. Somebody, let's say, calls our whistleblowing hotline. We take the call. We uh, inform them that the call is recorded and obtain their absent, uh, consent to record the call. We go through all of the questions we need to ask in order to understand exactly what they're complaining about and extract from it sufficient data that you can go and test it later because the hallmark of a good quality complaint is that it contains testable data. 
the hallmark of a poor quality complaint is that it's very long and it has no testable information in it whatsoever. We structure that into a report which we then provide to nominated parties at our clients. It's then sent directly to them or served to them via our portal. Uh, either way, the report is encrypted. And then, usually, uh, they, sometimes in conjunction with us, decide what they're going to do with it. We do not turn away a single complaint. Everything goes to the client. Every single complaint goes to the client. The fact is, yes, if the complaint is a stupid complaint, the client will assess it, come to the conclusion it's a stupid complaint, and not do anything. So in other words, it's, it's not that it's received and automatically, like Ghostbusters, we swing into action. It's received, we make sure that it's a comprehensible, testable complaint, we pass it on to our clients. So it's not, it's not expensive as a result. Uh, based on your experience, Owen, uh, what's your assessment for whistleblowing that handle or that has been handled by the CE's office? Right. So how does whistleblowing ha work when the recipient, I think, is at the, at the chief executive level? I think it's a very bad idea. Um, and I think it's a very bad idea because the theory is, as the chief executive, I say I will receive all complaints, and that shows that I really care about this. It's a, it's a, it's a very sensible, understandable uh, approach, but it doesn't work in practice. And it doesn't work in practice because the chief executive, to anybody below a certain grade, is kind of a demigod, basically. Nobody is going to annoy the chief executive or the permanent secretary with what they feel is not a slam dunk complaint. The few people who do often are cranks, and therefore that's not particularly helpful either. So the, the problem that you get when you have it going that high up is the availability of the chief executive, and you also have problems with actually wanting to contact the chief executive when you're somebody who doesn't have a mountain behind them, and you're talking to somebody on the top of Mount Olympus. Quite the conundrum. Mm. Um, Owen, is there a value for ministries, for example, it could be hypothetical, to have a separate whistleblowing hotline uh, given the following? A, a nominee of staff, not protected. B, public officers who are asked to report to permanent secretaries, and some of them which is his requirement, or C, people to report directly to CPIB or the AGO. So sorry, it, it, which is preferable? Is that the question? Yeah. Is there a value for ministries to have a separate whistleblowing hotline given the following of choices we just gave you? Right. Um, Yes, I think it is worth maintaining a, a whistleblowing hotline because it's available to all staff. That's the key thing. Um, you'll, you'll generally find, as I say, that lower grade staff are less inclined to ring CPIB, who, I mean, I used to be a government prosecutor and I still find CPIB scary. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are not going to be wanting to ring CPIB. Are you going to be wanting to ring people high up in the organization, such as the permanent secretary? No, I don't think you are. But what happens when you report through these hotlines is that the complaint is made, it works its way to the appropriate point in the organization, and the decision is still made. And it may well be that if assuming the complaint isn't about the permanent secretary, that the permanent secretary will be the one who gets to make the decision, this is a thing that needs to be reported to CPIB. So in other words, we're not talking about cutting the senior management decisions that need to be made out of the loop. We're talking about making sure that Everything is structured in a way that attracts the most useful information. That information is structured in a way that people can make the appropriate decisions at the appropriate level. But yeah, it's not about, it's not, about not reporting to CPIB or anyone else in the organization. It's about making sure you capture everything you can.